Hello, what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI 124 Queen Street, Durban. in the 
Talmud is not there. This is how the word originates. But Moses, we expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to the will of God, which is a very lengthy but beautiful definition of what he was out to do to preach the religion of God to mankind. A religion of total submission to God's will. One word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. When we come to Christianity, the same principles apply that Jesus Christ in his lifetime, he didn't hear the word Christianity, nor did he say I'm a Christian. <coughs> if he was with us here today in his second coming, and if we could have the privilege of questioning him, said, oh Jesus, what is your religion? I do not expect him to say Christianity, because if he did, I might ask him further, what church do you belong to? Are you a Roman Catholic, or a Dutch Reformed Church, or a Seventh-day Adventist, or a Jehovah's Witness? What Christianity do you belong to? So in other words, I expect Jesus to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. And one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam. The word Islam comes from the word Salam. Salam means peace, literally. In its religious connotation, Islam means a religion of total submission to the will of God. And the one who submits to such a system is called a Muslim. Again, the root word comes from Salama, to submit, peace, achieve peace by submitting to a higher authority. And we who follow the religion of Islam, we say we are Muslims, meaning we have submitted our will to the will of God. Whatever he wants us to do, we are prepared to do. He says, according to the information we have received through Muhammad, that we shall not worship any other God but Allah. So we say we accept. We are told that we must accept Muhammad as a messenger of God. We, say we accept. Say we mustn't touch alcohol. We will not. Say we can't eat pig. He says, no, we won't eat it. He says, don't gamble. He says, we won't gamble. If we must fast for one whole month, so that we will fast. Everything that we are told, we say, we claim that we submit. And one word for that is Muslim means one who has submitted. So we say Muhammad was a Muslim, we are Muslims. Jesus was a Muslim, and the Quran describes his disciples were Muslims, meaning they submitted the wills to the will of God. Muslim doesn't mean the follower of Muhammad, it means one who has submitted. In the garden, if you remember, garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ, he cried to his Lord and he said, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now that, not as I will, but as thou wilt. One word for that would be Muslim. He submitted. Whatever God wants him to do, he is prepared to go through with it. So we say, Moses was a Muslim, Jesus was a Muslim, Muhammad was a Muslim. Abraham, Abraham was a Muslim. Anyone who submits his will to the will of God is a Muslim. And the religion which they all follow is Islam. Now with regards to the religious books, these three great religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, uh, the two are contained in one book, Judaism and Christianity, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Bible of the Jews, the Old and the New put together the Bible of the Christians then we Muslims, we say that if there is such a thing as an Old Testament, and if there is such a thing as a New Testament, we say that there is such a thing as a Last Testament. You see, the Jew, he comes at the end of the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, and he puts a full stop. He, says he doesn't want to know anymore. Whatever God wanted to give, he has given him through the prophets, the Old Testament. The Christian feels that the Jew is doing injustice to himself, by not coming a step forward into greater knowledge and revelation of God. The Muslim says the same thing to the Christian. He says, you too are doing the very same thing that the Jews do. You come to the end of the book of Revelation, you also put a full stop. So why don't you come forward a step further and look into this last and final revelation of God, which we say is contained in the Holy Quran. Now religiously, there is great affinity between these three religions. They are, we say, the same religion, 
but on different levels. In the fundamentals of these three religions, there is not an iota of difference, as thought by the prophets, as thought by Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. If we take the first commandment of the Jews, the first commandment, in Hebrew, this is what it sounds like. The Shama Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad, which means literally, here, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. This is the first commandment as given by God through Moses and as recorded in the Old Testament. When we come to Jesus, we are told in the Gospel of St. Mark that a learned man of the Jews, described as a scribe, a learned man, he comes to Jesus and he questions, said, Master, in the Hebrew language, is a rabbi, a learned man, a priest. Master, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him, I'm quoting, in the Hebrew language, Shema Israel Adonai Ilaqainu Adonai Echad. Which means, again, hear Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. He repeated word for word what was given by Moses some 1300 years before, without the change of a dot. When we come to Muhammad some 600 years after Jesus, he is confronted by a delegation of Christians, a deputation came from it an area called Majran, outside Medina, and these Christians were questioning him with regards to theology and the teachings of Muhammad and the revelation that he had received. And during the course of the discussion, the spokesman for the Christian posed the question, O Muhammad, what is your concept of God? And Muhammad was made to say, as we believe, we Muslims believe, that Muhammad was inspired by God. He was made to utter words as they were put into his mouth. So he was made to say, as it is contained in the 112th chapter of the Holy Quran, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say he is God the one and only, the last word. Ahad, ahad means one and only, Jesus said ahad means one and only, Moses said ahad which means one and only. What is the difference between these three? Actually it's the same word meaning the same thing. The Hebrew language is said Echad, Arab, Arab, Arabic is Ahad. And if I write that on the board, you know, it's an amazing thing. If I write Ahad, I want to make it Echad, I just put a, a dot. That's all. That makes it Ha into the Ha. Ahad, Echad. Meaning the one and the same thing. Which means in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, we say no change at all. As given by the prophets. Then in the teachings also we find a relationship that each is an evolution of the teaching, previous teachings. For example, you see the children of Israel, they came out of the Egyptian bondage and they were moving into the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years, a wandering people moving from oasis to oasis. And under those circumstances, the Jews were given a law, a very beautiful law which was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Quick justice. If you injured my eye, I injure yours. Move on, there's work to be done. You broke my tooth, I break yours. There's justice to be done. Move on, there's work to be done. There's no time for lengthy litigations. There's no time for putting a man in concentration camp or prison. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Beautiful law. A Jesus or a Muhammad couldn't have done anything better in the wilderness for these Suppose, instead of Moses, it was Jesus. What would he have given? I said the same. He couldn't have chosen to turn the other cheek. See, because it was uncalled for there, in the desert. If it was Muhammad instead of Moses, what would he have said? I said word for word the same. Because coming from the same God, we believe that God Almighty was inspiring Moses to give solution to the problems of his people. The names of that personality doesn't matter. Whatever the name, the teaching would have been the same according to the needs of the people. Adultery. Moses gave the law that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. If it was Jesus, he would have done the same thing. If it was Muhammad, he would have done the same thing in the desert. 
Now, this, though it seems very harsh and cruel to us, this was the most merciful way of getting rid of an antisocial character. And I doubt that. Because the system as given by God Almighty to these Jews was a system in which they could have had limited number of wives. And I'm unlimited number of wives. You know, Solomon had a thousand wives and concubines. And God didn't say one word against that. Almost every prophet mentioned in the Old Testament had more than one wife. David, Jacob, you know he married two sisters at the same time. Abraham, he had altogether three wives. And so on. Almost every prophet you name, he had more than one wife. And God didn't say one word against that system. And a system which allowed unlimited number of wives. Why must you go and interfere with somebody else's property? <laughs> Can you see the logic of it? I mean, if one was not enough, you take number two. If two is not <laughs> enough, take four. If four is not enough, take forty. <laughs> Why do you have to go and despoil somebody else's property? That person is an antisocial character, and the best thing to do with him is kill him <laughs> and make him an object lesson for others. See? So, it's a very cruel thing. Stoning a person to death. You know, you can imagine. It's a slow, painful death. And this was to be done in public. Not hidden away somewhere, behind the walls, say in Victoria, what they call it, um, death row. No, where nobody knows what's going on. No. Bring the guy to the marketplace, the whole community gathers, and says, you see this adulterer, and this adulteress, this is justice being meted out to them. So suppose we were there, we said, not for me. Would you like to go through that? So can you see now, I said, if Jesus or a Muhammad couldn't have done anything better in the wilderness, it was a beautiful law for a nomadic people. But laws have a tendency to change the characters of people over a period of time. Any law. Well, let's take our own law. We are living in a color conscious country. Everything's based on color. And I can tell you my experience. For 40 years I've been talking to people. I love to talk. I love to talk. I love to share with people my thoughts and what little God has given me of my food. And let me tell you that I have invited hundreds of whites to my home. I invited Africans and colors and Indians, but I'm talking specifically about the whites. Hundreds of whites. Businessmen, learned men, priests, theologians, hundreds of them. And they come and enjoy my hospitality, they enjoy my food. You know, our food is good. You know, the food that we cook. I tell you, the white man, he, he, he laughs it up, he relishes it. The African, you know, he flogs it. And the color of the African, nobody, nobody can resist the food that we offer. Am I right? You <laughs> see, everybody loves our food. You know, maybe the way we put our spices and the way we cook, you know, the aroma that comes from our pots, you know, you just can't. Irresistible. So the white man, and the woman, they enjoy my food and they enjoy my talk. Because whatever I'm talking is from an angle which they might not have seen before. Because it's a, something novel to them. So they enjoy the talk and they enjoy the food. And they thank me profusely when they part. And subsequently when I meet them in the streets, oh, they shake hands with me. How it must be that? How is the family? Convey my regards to the missus. But no white man. By God, I tell you, no white man in 40 years has invited me to his home for a cup of tea. I am asking my European you know, people that I can talk to. I mean, look, I'm not trying to score any points against anybody. But I'm asking, don't you people know how to reciprocate in your culture, in your civilization? Is there no such thing as reciprocation? There is. There is. You do reciprocate, I know. Among yourselves, you do. You invite one another to your homes. But at the back of your mind, to invite a black man to your home, something else is involved. You personally may be a saint walking this earth, an angel walking this earth, but at the back of the mind, the laws of the country, color, 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 has knocked into your psyche. That thought that, look, this police coming to an elite area in Durban North, one Sunday morning, looking for your home, number 10 Downing Street, and, you know, with this funny headgear, 
and this beard, looking for that number 10, and eventually he finds it. There are people watering the garden, there are people sitting on the veranda. This one is just pulling you around here. And then, maybe, you know, I find the house, I knock at the door, Mrs. Smith opens the door, and because she has enjoyed my hospitality, she's so happy. She says, come in, Mr. B, that, come in. She means well. I go inside, and we start chatting again, and religion is a deep subject, you know, you might carry on for hours, and tongues begin to wag. She says, what is that doing inside here? What are they doing? Running a shibi, you know what? <laughs> what is Mrs. Smith doing? What business is she in now? Or, another <coughs> relation of the family comes in, they find this black man there, brown man. So my host will have to go out of his way to explain my presence there. He said, you know, this is Mr. D. Dad. You know, when we went to his house, his family, they received us so well and they gave us such nice food and what and what not. Oh, you're going out of your way actually to justify my presence there. You know it. You have to justify what is this guy doing here in the house. So to avoid all that, best thing is Convey my regards to the missus, you know. This is what it is. Laws have a tendency to change the characters of people over a period of time. In Hitlerite Germany, a nation so civilized, so cultured, the nation of Goethe and Beethoven, one of the most cultured nations in Europe, he could stoop down to incinerating six million Jews with the fact of fiction. The fact is, even six Jews. Six million Jews, and this cultured nation, Christian nation, allowed it. As a people, 90 million Germans were Christians, even if Hitler was an atheist. They allowed this massacre to take place? Why? Program, brainwashing. You know, the Jews, the Jews, Christ killers, kill them. You know, they deserve it. So the whole nation, you know, if inwardly you might have felt uneasy, but it says, well, you know, they deserved it. They're getting it, what's coming to them, you know. But they weren't. 90 million Germans, they were quite happy with what happened. Lords have a tendency to change the characters of people over a period of time. A thousand years and three hundred between Moses and Jesus, the Jews, these very laws which were meant to mold the character and rule, create a happy community, those laws perverted the standards. They were told an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So, if I was chasing the birds with that old-fashioned sling, you know the one that David used to kill Goliath, I was only trying to chase the birds, and by accident, injured a Jewish eye, another Jew, injured his eye. So he goes to the judge, and he says, you see this guy here? He damaged my eye. And the Lord him on, an eye for an eye. Damaged his. So I, suppose I was that unfortunate Jew of the time, I would plead as a look man, brother, I didn't mean to damage your eye. It was an accident. Forgive me. He says, no, but the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I said, look, I'm prepared to compensate you. I'll give you a kid from the flock. I'll give you a heifer. Forgive me. He says, no, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You see, he is going for the letter of the law and he's forgetting the spirit. So, Jesus. Another spiritual physician among the Jews. He comes on the scene and he sees this perversion, this sickness, that they have gone for the letter of the law and they have forgotten the spirit. So wanting to bring them back to that wire media, the balanced road, he gives them another extreme as an antidote. As it has been said by them of old time, Jesus said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist no evil. He who strikes you on the right cheek, give the other. If a person takes away your coat, give me a blow of Agree with thy adversary quickly, while thou art with him on the way. If a person makes you to walk one mile, walk with him too. In other words, go to the other extreme. This is an antidote for a sickness, which is a beautiful antidote for a sickness. But we Muslims, what we say is this, that that antidote will not work. <coughs> because you haven't got the sickness. Your sickness has changed. And as your sickness changes, the remedy must change. And in that change, we Muslims claim that Muhammad brought that last and final revelation of God Almighty. 
he has given us a law and we say is the fulfillment of the laws as given by Moses and Jesus. And Jesus Christ, he himself had foretold. In the Gospel of St. John, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, to the Jews, many things. But ye cannot bear them now. In other words, you haven't got the capacity to grasp this knowledge. God has given it to him. He could have guided mankind for eternity till doomsday. But the people who were the recipients of that message were not fit to receive it, as he said. But ye, you, cannot bear them now. And the truth of that statement is writ large in the Bible. You read it again and again in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Jesus telling his disciples, ye of little faith, ye of little faith. How many times? Again and again. He explains to them, as he was explaining to little children, and they can't grasp the message. So he says, are ye even yet without understanding? And when he's provoked further, he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation. This is carrying his disciples. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I say, if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed Honorable Harakiri. <laughs> <laughs> you know the way they gave him trouble, trouble endless with the police father. <laughs> you know, they gave him endless trouble. Everything he is telling them, they misunderstand. They misconstrue. Everything. So he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them. Ah, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things we shall he hear, then shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. Now we Muslims, we say that that spirit of truth is Muhammad. <coughs> he glorified Jesus to an extent that the Christian, when he listens to what the Quran says about Jesus, he falls on his back. He can't believe his ears. He thinks that the Muslim is hypocritical. Because when the Muslim says that we Muslims, we believe in Jesus. So we believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he was born miraculously without any made intervention. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind in the lepers by God's permission. The white Christian feels that we are trying to scratch his back so he may scratch ours. <laughs> you know, if I say a few good words about your Jesus, maybe you might say a few good words about my Muhammad. <laughs> I said, look, maybe in the South African situation, you know, we might have a tendency to do that. We are human, we are weak, and we Muslims in South Africa, our brother Sabin Khan, we are a minority of a minority. The Indian is a minority, and in that minority we are one-fifth. We are a minority of a minority, we are very weak. In numbers, in everything, we are very weak. So as such now, if we flatter the whites, the Christians, to get some crumbs somewhere along the line, we could be excused. But I said, no. Here is a book, Quran for the Quran. In it, if you, this particular one here has an index, and if you open the index and open the subject Jesus, you'll be amazed. The word name Jesus occur in this holy book of ours, in the text no less than 25 times. The name Muhammad in this whole volume only five times. Muhammad, supposed to be the author of this book, his name occurs in the whole book five times. The name Jesus, 25 times. There is a chapter in this book called Surah Maryam, means chapter Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. There is no chapter in this book in the name of Muhammad's mother, or his wife, or his daughter. But there is a chapter called Mary, Maria, chapter 19. So it's quite an amazing thing. You know, amazing book this is. Speaking so much more about Jesus, about his birth. Muhammad's birth is not described. The birth of Jesus. We open the, the index, and we begin this one here. Jesus, a righteous prophet. Chapter 6, verse 85. His birth is described in two places. Chapter 3, verses 45 to 47, in chapter 19, verses 23 onwards. And if I open and let you hear, I have done it to the Colby Association in Marysburg. 
a group of Roman Catholics professional called the association. And when I read it to them, I also happened to be in Siddhartha, the Siddhartha Theological Seminary. And there I also opened the book of God and I read it to the students there. And they just can't seem to believe. I said, look, why don't you see it for yourself? It says, chapter 3 I'm starting. In Arabic this is what it sounds like. So, what is قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ says, behold, the angel said, O oh Mary, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَحَرَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى رِسَعِ الْعَالَمِينَ That God has chosen thee and purified thee. Chosen thee above the women of all nations. I'm reading the Quran. Not the Bible. The Quran. Mary, the mother of Jesus, according to the Quran, is chosen above the women of all nations. يَا مَرْيَمُ كُنُتِّي لِرَبِّكِ وَاسْجُدِي وَرْكَئِ مَا الرَّاطِئِينَ So, O oh Mary, worship thy Lord the Father. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. the down, verse 45. So, why is Tala til malaika to ya Maryamu? Behold the angel said, O Mary, in Allah you bashiruki bi kalimatim minhu. Say, Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. Is muhul masih, his name will be the Messiah. Say, Messiah word. Arabic is masih, Hebrew Messiah. Ismuhul Masih Washihan fi dunya wal akhira Held in honor in this world and in the hereafter Wa minal muqarrabeen And of the company of those nearest to God Wa yukallimu nasa And he will speak to the people Fil mahdi wa kahlan In childhood and in maturity Wa minas salihin And he shall be of the company of the righteous When this good news is given to Mary Naturally She protests Saying, Qalat Rabbi Anna Yakun Li Waladun Walam Yam Sasni Bashar She said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? The angel says in reply, Qalat Atalik Illa Yaqub Ma Yasha See, even so, Allah creates what He wills. Wa iza qada amran Whenever He decrees a matter Fa inna ma yakulu lahu kun fa yakun He merely says to it, be and it is. This is a Muslim concept of the word of Jesus. That for God to create Anything, a Jesus, without a father, he has got to will it and it can come to be. It is not necessary for God to take a seed and plant it by artificial insemination or any other matter. He wills it, a Jesus without a father, just like that. A million Jesuses without father and without mother, just like that. But who will breastfeed them without father, without mother? Can you see, he needed a mother. Now, the the respect with which we take the holy name of Jesus in Islam. No Muslim learned man can ever come before the Muslim congregation and speak about Jesus as Isa. Isa means Jesus in Arabic. We can never say Isa. He must say Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, revered Jesus, may peace be upon him. If he just says Isa, which means Jesus, he'll be kicked out. Go, Babirin. You take the name of a mighty messenger of God and you call him just like that Isa, that's why I call him Dida, instead of calling me Mr. Dida. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is how we take his holy name. Now, I say that that prophecy that I just read to you refers to Muhammad. <coughs> I might conclude that I can carry on like this for, you know, for an hour, for two hours, but that is not my purpose. I'd like to give you an opportunity of asking me questions. But I end by rereading that verse with a little emphasis on the pronouns which will give you an idea that this person that Jesus was prophesying about was not a ghost, was not a spirit, was not a spook. The words, again. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them. Now, how be? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. For what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. I'm asking, learning people, can you find another verse in this whole encyclopedia for the Bible? With eight masculine pronouns, one verse. With eight masculine pronouns, or feminine pronouns, or neuter genders, 
I would like to see that. I am sure there isn't. In other words, Jesus Christ was emphasizing that the person who is going to come to guide mankind into all truth will be a man, a man, a man. And we say that man was Muhammad. This is our belief. Uh, but I'm open to questions. I leave it to you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I'm at your disposal. Indeed, I'm just standing here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just standing here. <laughs> I suppose you see the Westerner, the real pronunciation is Muslim. But sometimes when you spell it M U, the Englishman has a tendency of Muslim, you know, like Muslim. So some people go out of the way to take the precaution that you don't make Muslim out of us, so they put a Muslim, you know, it means the same. Thing. You're trying to say yeah, the same thing. You, you acknowledge Jesus Christ as a prophet. More than a prophet. Is it, do you regard him then as the son of, uh, of Christ, uh, of, the, of God? You see, I would say yes, and I would say no. <coughs> see, yes, uh, metaphorically, in, in the sense in which God speaks about the righteous, his righteous servants in the Holy Bible, mm. whom he describes as the sons of God. Because according to that, God has got sons by the tons in the Bible, in your Bible. He's got them by the tons. But when you ask an ordinary Christian, a <coughs> layman, how many sons has God got? He's the one. It's the only son, it's the only son. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3, it says, And the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them to wife all that they chose. And when the sons of God, in African seals for the heart, and when the sons of God uh, came in and were the daughters of men and bore children to them, they became great men of old, men of renown. In the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Jeremiah, he says, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Psalms, God speaks to David and he says, I will declare a decree unto thee that thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. In the New Testament, we are told, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of in other words, anybody, everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry, if you follow the will and plan of God, you are a godly person. In the language of the Jew, you are a son of God. It's a metaphorical statement. Everybody who follows, like Jesus told the Jews, he said, you are of your father the devil. Now, did they have those sharp ears of horns or tail with barbed hooks, but were they less handsome than his own disciples or himself? No. What did he mean he said, you are of your father the devil? Meaning that if you do not hearken unto the word of God which I am giving to you, you are hearkening to the suggestions of the devil, then you are devilish. In the language of the Jew, your father is the devil. If you are a godly person, in the language of the Jew, your father is God. He said, in that sense, I say Jesus was preeminently the Son of God. Because he would be more faithful to God than any of us can ever be. From that point of view, we say Jesus is the Son of God. But we Muslims, we take exception to the Christian. When he says that Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten, not made. This is what he says in his catechism. Begotten, not made. So I'm asking the Englishman, because I seem to know English better than any other language. So I, naturally, I have more dialogue with English-speaking people than with anybody else. So I said, now, excuse me, sir. When you say begotten, not made, what are you trying to emphasize? Will you please explain? When you say begotten, not made, what are you really trying to tell me? And believe me, no Englishman yet in my 40 years of experience has opened his mouth to tell me what it means. I don't know, maybe you people might be brave. An American, yes. Uh, I met an American, <laughs> of course he speaks English. He said it means sired by God. So what? <laughs> he said, no, no. You ask me what it means. So I'm telling you what it means. <laughs> what did you say? So no, no. I'm only telling you when you say begotten, not made, it means sight by God. Of course, that is what you don't mean. So what do you mean? He said, no, no, it doesn't mean that. So I said, if it doesn't mean that, why do you say that? 
Can't you see you creating unnecessary conflict between me and you? You are creating, if you don't mean it, why say it? Because that is the thing that's dividing 1,200 million Christians of the world and 1,000 million Muslims. They're divided just because of that, the way you are saying things. Maybe, I said, you are sincere, you mean well. But you know, when you are talking these terms, you don't know the implications in your own language. I don't know what your implications of what you are saying. So we Muslims are getting horrified when you talk about begotten, not made, so we take exception to you. see? So we are fighting over words. Say, why did you say that? And then you say, look, I don't mean that. Like the Englishman, you know, he speaking about his wife, he's speaking to her mother, mother. You know, he's telling him, he's talking about the children, say, mother. So I ask this Englishman, is she really your mother? She younger than you. I said, yes. Is she your stepmother? He says, no. Then you say, mother? <coughs> How is she your mother? He said, no, no. My children call her mother, and I love the terms so I also call her mother. I said, bloody fool, why don't you tell me she's your wife? <laughs> Our problem is words. But to carry that further, didn't the, the Holy Ghost, if I don't know if you accept that, uh, 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 visit Mary at the time of the conception. Yes. And then whose child what did Mary carry then? If it's, if it's not it's the not son the of God. You see, now, in other words, at the back of the mind, when you're posing that question, it means you still stand by begotten, not made. Mm. You see, Adam was made by God. By the act of will. You believe, I believe. Everything he created was by the act of will. Be, and it is. So you agree and I agree. But you say, Jesus, because now he had no father there, so his father is God. I said, the first thing he created, every dog, pig, and donkey, whose father was it? Who, who was the father of all these things? Or the cockroach and the rat? Who? God. God, in other words, he is our Lord and cherisher, our revolver, our creator, and our nourisher. As such, we say he is the father of everything. In the case of Jesus, as the Quran says, for God to create, whenever he decrees a matter, who God Almighty, he merely says to be and it is. In other words, he willed it and Jesus came into being. As he willed the universe to come into being, the universe came into being. As he willed mankind to come into being, of course we do not take literally you know what you think that God Almighty took a lump of clay and he molded the shape of a man and you know he breathed into it and he became a man. Then he took another lump of clay, you know, maybe an elephant, and then he breathed into an <coughs> elephant. He took another lump of clay and you know became a bed bug. Another one a lice. I said, My God doesn't work like that. You know the concept I have of God Almighty. The Quran says, But you somehow to him is due the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. Again, the very same words. He said, whenever he declares a matter, he merely wills it and they come into being. And the Bible also confirms in the book of Corinthians, it is said, by faith we know that the heavens and the, heavens and the earth were created by the word of God and that the things visible came through the force invisible. It means the invisible will of God brought everything to being. As such, God is the creator, father, sustainer, everything of everybody. But physically, we say God does not beget. So this was by will of God that doesn't make Jesus primarily any more important as son of God than Adam. Because Adam had no father and no mother. If Jesus, because he had no father, if that makes him the son of God, then Adam has a greater right to be the son of God than Jesus. Chapter 3, the last verse, he says, and Adam, the son of God. So, I said, you see, it's a metaphorical statement. God created him by the act of will. Glory goes to God. Glory be to God. For, as the scripture says, uh, when Jesus performed those miracles, impossible things, he said, glory be to God for giving such powers unto men. Glory goes to God. Again and again. So, we glorify God, creating Jesus without a human father. So, it doesn't mean literally that God becomes his father. He is as much Jesus' father as our father. And Jesus Christ, you remember, in the prayer which he taught us, he said, come, I will teach you how to pray. They pray like this. Oh, our father, 
which are in heaven, including Judas, because so Judas was in the group. He is the father of even Judas. O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we say, God Almighty is the Father of everyone. But physically, he doesn't beget. And as such, we are taking exception to the terminology that you are using. He is preeminently the Son of God metaphorically, but physically not. This is the Muslim standard. And therefore, when he died on the cross, do you accept that he died to save us from our sins? No. You <coughs> see, <laughs> with apologies, you know, I'm reading this book, the Bible. I take it you are English speaking. Yes. You are. That makes it better still. You see, you know, I'm telling the English speaking person, I said, you know, you read this book, the Bible, in your own mother tongue. Because the Bible is now available in 1,500 different languages. <coughs> in Hindustani, in Tamil, in English, in Zulu, Afrikaans, what language you want? 1,500 different languages. Arabic, Gujarati, my language. Two in Gujarati, I'll tell you why we have the time. Why two in Gujarati? Eleven for the Arabs, eleven different Arabic Bibles. Man, no man has an excuse anymore for saying, you know, I haven't got access to the word of God direct. I said, no, you have it direct in English. And yet, I'm finding that the English man, when he's reading this book, I'm telling him, I said, you know, you are so programmed. With apologies. I said, you are so programmed that you are reading a book in your own mother tongue and you are made to understand the exact opposite of what you're reading. Not just misunderstanding. For example, if you read a statement, thou shalt not commit adultery, you are understanding thou shalt commit adultery. So how can you say that? You can be said perverts as well. Something special here has happened. That you're reading something and you're understanding the opposite of what you're reading. So what you what are you referring to? I said, you remember, sir, when Jesus returned to that upper room, where they had the last supper, after his alleged crucifixion, he goes in and he wishes his disciples, peace be unto you, shalom at home in Hebrew, peace be unto you. And when his disciples recognized that this is Jesus, they were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. He thought, I'm only quoting, because they thought he was. I said, why should they think the man is a spirit? Did he look like a spirit? And everybody says, no. Then I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? Confused. So I said, look, I'll help you. You see the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay that he had given up the ghost, in other words, he had died, his spirit had come out. They had heard from hearsay that now he's dead and buried for three days. A man with such a reputation, when you see him naturally, you're terrified because you expect him to be stinking in his grave. So, they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. So Jesus says, Behold my hands and my feet. Have a look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. I'm the same fellow man. What are you afraid of me for? Say, handle me and see. This is basic English. What is the Queen's English? You don't need a dictionary and you don't need a theology. Your book in your language, I'm reading. Say, handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones. As you see me have. A spirit has no flesh and bones. So if I've got flesh and bones, in that case, I'm telling the Englishman, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a spook, I'm not a ghost, am I right? Is that what it means in your language? So everybody says yes. If I said I have flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I'm asking the Africana, is that what it means in your language? And he says yes, and the Zulu is yes, everybody agrees, 100 percent. That if I have flesh and bones, then I'm not the other. I say, in other words, Jesus is telling you, that the body that you are seeing, it is not a translated body, it is not a metamorphosed body, it is not a resurrected body. Because the resurrected body is get spiritualized. So the learned man said, who says so? I said, Jesus. You say, where? I said, Luke, Luke chapter 24, 36. You are quoting 24, 36, go back, four chapters. So what does he say? You want me to tell you what he says? Sir? He says, you see the Jews were coming to him with poses, riddles again and again. Now they come to him. They said, Master, there was a Jewess among us, and that Jewess, according to a Jewish custom, had seven husbands. You know, if one fellow died and left no offspring, then the second fellow takes that wife. 
And when he feels the third and the fourth and the fifth, six, seven guys had this one woman. But there was no problem why here on this earth, because it was one by one. Now they want to know from Jesus that at the resurrection, which guy is going to have her? Because they all had her here. In other words, if you had a woman here, then naturally when you see her on the other side, everybody says, bro, my wife, everybody wants to grab her, seven guys. There will be a war in heaven between seven brothers for one woman. Because they all wake up simultaneously. That's your belief, my belief. So seven guys waking up and seeing this woman, everybody wants to grab her. So there will be a war. It's kind of It's mine. It's <laughs> that's, that's the problem the Jews have in the mind, see, that there will be a war in heaven between the brothers of the woman. In answer to that, Jesus said, neither shall they die anymore. In other words, once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. This is the mortal body, which has got its mortal needs, food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these things, no Englishman left, no African left, no Irishman left, no, all that. You see, this is the law. Say, neither shall they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels. In other words, they will be angelized. The resurrected bodies will be angelized. <coughs> they will be spiritualized. They will be spiritual creatures. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. Such are the children of the resurrection. Such spirits. He said the spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him. And they believed not for joy and wonder. I'm only reading. Means they were overjoyed. What happened, man? He's alive. So he said, have you here any meat? Something to eat? And they gave him a piece of fried fish and a honeycomb and he took it and he ate in the very sight. I said, to prove what? I'm the same for the man. They are fools. What are you afraid of me for? Can you see? <laughs> with apologies. You see, so I say, sir, with apologies. Okay. You see, we are all being programmed from childhood into certain attitudes, into certain beliefs. We do. The Muslims is no exception to that rule. We are all getting programmed from childhood. You are also programmed. The only thing is that I am prepared to be deprogrammed. You know, the Muslims say, come, come, let's talk. Let's reason together. Let's have a dialogue. Reprogram me. Deprogram, reprogram. Are you prepared to do that? So come, let us read this book. And I assure you that you have misunderstood every word by God. Every word you have misunderstood in your own language. If you read this in Hebrew and you say, look, I don't understand Hebrew, I can sympathize with you. If you read it in Greek and say, look, I don't understand Greek, I can, sy I can sympathize with you. But I said, you English man, you read the Bible in English, and you have got the wrong end of the state. And you African and Africans, I said, you got the wrong end of the state. And you, you Zulu in Zulu, I said, you got the wrong end of the state. You are misunderstanding every word that's written there. <laughs> I was, I was warned, I was not to preach. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> you ask me a question, I can't help responding. It's a refreshing <laughs> evening. <laughs> I hope no offense was meant. Please forgive me if I said anything to hurt anybody's feeling in any way. Please, I didn't mean it. You know, it's just that's me. You ask me, I have to. I can't be hypocritical and say, no, 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 you are right and you are right. And uh, face the Lord. I rather speak to you, I know next time you won't have oh uh, by the way, I happen to be one of the guides to the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere. I overheard um, father saying about you visiting a Hindu temple, which you must. Father said, Have you visited the largest mosque south of the equator is in Durban, right in the center of the city? And I happen to be one of the official guides and my services are absolutely free. And I take you all for dinner or for lunch after that. How's that? You know? So that applies to all of you. This is the mosque. This is the picture of the mosque. You know, if I can tempt you with a dinner and a <laughs> This is the picture of the mosque. The principles of Islam are on the first. Thank you very much. Are the time for dates? No, any time. You do Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, daytime, nighttime, any time. Because I'd like to share, to explain to you what goes on answer your questions, anything there, and you must complete your mental picture of the Indian community, which is that there are three ty types of Indians in South Africa. Racially, we are dozens of different kinds. We are racially dozens of different. Uh, religiously, there are three main groups, Indian Christian, Indian Hindu, and Indian <coughs> Indian Christian will be the same as the white Christian. Same. You have the Roman Catholics and the Seventh Day Adventists. Whatever you have, we also have. Same. Then there are Indian Hindus, you go into the Hindu temple, it opens up your outfit. 
Hindu religion, you go to the mosque and say that these are the Muslims, sir. What they do? It will be my privilege to take you all on a guided tour of the mosque and then take you for lunch or for dinner, whatever suits you. Any day or night, it will be my privilege. Thank you. On behalf of the students, Mr. Dita, may I express our very sincere thanks to you for giving up this time to be with us and in a very refreshing way saying to us, look to your Bibles um, and read them carefully because um, there is such richness um, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and, and the Last Testament. Testament. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you, Mr. Sheikh Ahmad Didet created an institution which has affected people throughout the world. The post-September 11th has created a great deal of animosity towards Muslims. Mosques in America and throughout the world were targeted and even damaged. The focus on the world today is Islam and the Muslims, and we have the best opportunity to turn this focus and present Islam. Sheikh Ahmad Didar has successfully halted the worldwide Christian missionary onslaught against Islam and inspired the Muslim world with the, his unique contributions, which is a legacy that we have all inherited. Man being a rational entity is dependent upon and in need of reason for a proper expression of its personality. A person's ethics, behavior, relationship with other individuals will be based on how he or she perceives the reason for one's existence. It is a question which affects the mental state and determines our social and physical behavior. It is a responsibility which mankind has to bear in mind in providing information and training. Since the illness and incapacity of Sheikh Ahmad Didat, a new set of trustees have taken over the running of the IPCI. The primary objective is to continue and expand the work of Sheikh Ahmad Didat and to train people in his method of dawah. Our training program is focused on creating the future Didats. The Holy Quran, chapter 21, verse 16, and chapter 44, verse 38 says, We have not created the heavens and the earth and all that is in between them for idle play. The mosque is the house of God Almighty. We hold every aspect of ourselves in trust. We do not own it. We are accountable to the Creator for its upkeep and development to its maximum potential. We have to develop this society. Our life is not for play. It is a job and we are required to do it well. We have been given detailed instructions to guide us in performance of this task. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, showed us the way the service should be performed. If we fail to realize our duty, we are failing the purpose for which we were created. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even states in the Holy Quran, chapter 51, verse 56, we have not created the jinn and the human beings except for service. Unfortunately, we have lost the wider significance of service and have become more ritually inclined. The universe is governed by laws. The Creator calls these laws His signs and advises us to observe them, understand them, and use them to our advantage. Our minds are limited and will change if we can successfully perform the tasks for which we were created. We are part of the scheme and we have to do the work to become the successful people. Saudi's ambassador to South Africa, Dr. Saud Zidane at the IPCI function said, Our work is not done once we have delivered our message. He has seen cases in the townships where a group of people have studied and embraced Islam and the missionaries came in with their aid programs only to undo whatever work we have done. The ambassador expressed his joy and said he will make himself available at all times to the IPCI, whose founder he holds in high esteem. Sheikh Ahmad Didad has established a visit to the mosque as one of its core functions for visitors to witness what transpires in the house of God Almighty. Sheikh Ahmad Didad and the late Mr. Vanker personally conducted tours for over the 25-year period. Students from schools, training colleges, church groups, civic institutions, fire departments, police force and other public were invited via press adverts. We need your help financially or otherwise to be stronger now than we were before. We cannot afford to lose people into religions other than what God Almighty has chosen for mankind. 
Help us to help others. As Sheikh Ahmed Didad said, if we had the means, we would flood the world. Help us financially to distribute these audios, videos, DVDs, and literature to all corners of the globe, even to those who cannot afford it. The video program that you will view is a must in every home. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادعو الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادلهم بالتي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو اعلم بالمهتدين صدق الله صدق الله العظيم this is a Muslim house of prayer and it is called a mosque. A Hindu house of prayer, a temple, a Jewish house of prayer, a synagogue, a Christian house of prayer, a church. This is a Muslim house of prayer and it is called a mosque. And allow me to welcome you all with the traditional Islamic salutation of wishing you all Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you all. You see, when we Muslims, when we meet one another, we wish one another Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you, and the hearer replies Wa Alaikum Assalam, and on you also be peace. So, with that salutation, I welcome you all. I say Assalamu Alaikum, peace be unto you all. Jesus uttered these words in the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19, 21, and 26. If we analyze the words good morning or good afternoon, what does it mean? It means that we should enjoy ourselves for a particular period of time. Whereas when the prophets greeted one another, they said peace, which was for eternity. The very first thing that you were asked to do when you entered this house of prayer was to take off your shoe. In the book of Acts chapter 7 verse 33 and Exodus chapter 3 verse 5, God Almighty commanded Moses Put off thy shoe from off thy feet, for the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. In the Holy Quran, chapter 20, verses 11 and 12, it is stated, فَلَمَّا أَطَاهَا نُودِيَا يَا مُوسَى إِنِّي أَنَا رَبُّكَ فَقْلَانَا عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِالْوَعْدِ الْمُقَدَّسِ تُوَى When Moses came to the fire, a voice was heard, O Moses, verily I am thy God. Therefore, in my presence, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for thou art in the valley of Tuwa. In Afrikaans, and he said, Muni nadar komni, trek yo skuna, fan yo futa af, van de plek var yo opstaan, is heli gegrond. In Zulu, so what you unga sundeli lapa, kumre ziktatolo zako, zinyawe ni zako, ngoguba indawo, omiguyo, ngomshabad yo ingwele. So in respect of that commandment, we Muslims, we take off our shoes. Because to us, Moses is as much our prophet as Jesus and Muhammad are. We accept them all as the mighty messengers of God. Now, before we go in for prayer, we make ablution. In other words, all the exposed parts of the body are being washed. The hands, the feet, the nostrils, the nape of the neck, gargling the mouth, brushing the teeth. Now, this the Muslim does 
five times a day, every day of the year. The one who's particular with his prayers. 